My name is Willie Bolin. I study influence, persuasion, and leadership in selling and sales management, and I teach people how to sell. In this podcast, we'll talk to some of the world's top sales leaders and see what we can learn from them. Welcome to the Sales Lab. This episode of the Sales Lab is brought to you by the 2020 International Collegiate Sales Competition, a sales recruiting event happening November 11th through 14th in sunny Orlando, Florida. Look, we all know that recruiting top talent is a persistent challenge for sales organizations. The mission of the ICSC is to enhance the selling profession by encouraging the development of the critical sales skills needed by today's collegiate sales graduates in a fun and competitive environment and provide a venue where companies can meet the nation's top collegiate sales talent in one place. This year, the ICSC will be attended by over 500 sales-focused college students from over 90 universities who come to compete in either a sales role-play competition, a sales management case competition, or both. Will your organization be there to hire the best of the best from around the country? Visit www.icsc-fsu.org, that's ICSC as an International Collegiate Sales Competition, Dash FSU, as in Florida State University, dot org, for more information on how you can get involved. Don't let these great recruits go to your competitors. In this episode of the Sales Lab, we're going to continue our conversation with Tommy Herman from Qualtrics. This is part two of a two part series with him. Uh, this time, we'll talk a little bit about culture fit, uh, culture versus aesthetics. And, you know, I don't want to say too much about it, but something about tacos and a naked interview. Uh, Of course, we'll close this one off with some book recommendations from Tommy as well. Hope you get something out of it, and thanks for tuning in. So you start people with the product knowledge, uh, then into the sales process. Mm -hmm. That's correct? Hypothetical for you. Question for you. Thought Mm -hmm. experiment. Yeah. What if you switch the two? We've done that. You've done that. You've yeah. led with the sales process and then into the product mm-hmm. details. Yeah, and it's um, it, it's definitely an interesting, thought provoking question, right? Because what I hear from a lot of my frontline guys is is oh man, if I could not make so many cold calls and just and be in the product and have that product knowledge, I could be more effective on my calls. And again, to an extent, yeah, probably right. But what we what we had when we did go with with product first was that people. We're getting into the really nitty gritty of our software, right? The, the, the very uh, features. And in a two week boot camp crash course, you learn just enough about product to get yourself in a, in a pickle on a call, mm-hmm. right? Where you mentioned something for us like uh, we have uh, skip logic or display logic, one of our, our survey you know, features that we have as far as what, what questions pop and, and show it at certain times of the survey. And uh, if, if you're bringing it up in a call, that, that might pique somebody's interest and they might ask a little bit more about that. But somebody that's got three weeks into their job, Again, they know just enough to get themselves in trouble. And so our mindset is like, yeah, we put them through product training, but it's um, it's uh, enough to have the knowledge of the business impacts, not necessarily features. And so what we saw in the early days when, when we first started the SDR program was that a lot of, a lot of um, salespeople were talking about features mm-hmm. and trying to pitch that as opposed to the actual business ROI or benefit. So we do put them through, uh, through product training. We actually have... Uh, uh, something called RC certification research core is our main research engine. The main product that we sell, a lot of our products are kind of auxiliary or, or applications that plug into that. So the research core is our main survey engine product. And uh, within the first 90 days, they have to get RC certified. So there, there is training uh, involved in that. You have to pass off an exam that actually proves that you know uh, the product fairly well. But what we want them to know initially is not product features, but product impact. Because that's on a cold call, SDRs, that's what they're talking about. They shouldn't be talking about skip skip, skip logic and our reporting capabilities and exporting uh, not, not getting in those we the weeds of those technical details. Yeah. Well, that's interesting. I actually, I really like that. And the reason I ask is that I, along with some colleagues, we've debated this over, uh, you know, a couple back and forth over beers that, you know, because certainly mm-hmm. one of the temptations for newer salespeople is to be the walking brochure, yep. you know. And we certainly see it with sales students. We can go out into the field and see it with, uh, you know, a- adults, real people, non-students, right? And we've wondered if if you start with the product, and a lot of companies do, you know, if, they, if it's a week of training, if it's a decade of training, the first chunk of that is going to be, well, how can I expect you to sell if you don't know the product? Yeah. What we do in universities is exactly the opposite, right? We start with the sales process. We'll apply a product to do a exercise or an activity, 
and then we'll switch the product. Mm -hmm. And we're trying to get them to understand that there's some psychological commonalities that occur in interpersonal influence situations. There's a common method that you can apply across situations. You, know, you adapt it. It's yep. not it's not a script. It's not a straight jacket. But there's some commonalities. And we want you to be able to apply those common things across situations and not get bogged down with, hey, man, you, you know, you like red? We have it in red. Yeah. We also have it in blue. You like blue? You know? uh-huh. But there's a temptation to talk about the product, especially if, you know, it's kind of like, well, the first... I got to training and the first thing I heard about was these features and these benefits. So what do I think is most important? Yeah. Maybe the features and the benefits. Yeah. But I kind of like what you're saying, right? Okay, so, so let's pull some of those details out and let's just talk about the impact. Let's talk yeah. about the why, not the what, not not even not even the how necessarily, but what our product can do for the customer. That's that's uh, yeah. that's pretty interesting. Can you give us some examples of uh, the types of things that you might emphasize? In, in a training regard? setting? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, from day one, we, we onboard every month, the Monday closest to the 15th of each month. So we iterate a lot. Um, you know, it, it, it's uncommon for us not to have somebody ramping on our team just with how, how quick we're growing and whatnot. And so every single month, what I tell new hires, the best thing they can do, because I get that question, we hire really smart people. So they come in thinking, hey, there's a lot. I got to go learn. Like, wh- point me in the right direction. Where should I start? Case studies, customer success stories, right? It has nothing to do with features. It is specifically, we have really cool videos that we pump out. We also have just uh, kind of publicized case studies, and it's always the same format. What is the before scenario? What was the problem or the business pain this, in, this specific company had? What was the use case? How was Qualtrics implemented? Was it customer experience? Was it running a VOC campaign? Was it uh, doing employee studies? And then ultimately, what is, what is the quantifiable outcome, right? We reduce churn by 5%. We increase our revenue by 30%. We increase the, the quality or the, the quantity of our research by 50%, whatever it is, right? And so it, it gets them in this mindset of business problem one, application two, outcome three. And to your point, red, blue, financial space, hospitality space, food and beverage, whatever, right? It doesn't really matter. That's a, that's kind of the, the double-edged sword of qual, a product like Qualtrics is that we're not verticalized. Our product is adaptable and applicable to any organization out there. So as a sales rep, it's tough, right? It's really cool and exciting because I can go sell to the CMO at Pepsi on one call and the very nice call, I'm talking to Bob's Fish Shack down the street, right? And same product, but different needs, different applications, uh, obviously different price points. But that's kind of the, the beauty of it is, is that it's always fresh and new and challenging. The, the flip of that is, is that it is challenging. It's hard, right? So to be able to go sell to a CMO versus a, a, a startup down the street, uh, different different sales methodologies, sell cycles, and and everything else, and so that's kind of what we point to first and foremost is is I tell my my reps go learn case studies, go learn the stories. You don't got to know product, right? But go see what the what the actual ROI quantifiable business impact was because that's immediate validation on a phone, right? If I get on a call, it really my my goal. I don't care if my prospect remembers my name. I really don't care if they even remember the name Qualtrics. Most of them do because it's a unique name. But I do want to make sure he remembers the story that I told him about the impact we had with Walmart, right? Or or Sears or JetBlue or whatever whatever the, the case study is or this, the client story that we're sharing. So I think that's kind of first and foremost. And, and to your point, whatever we lead with, that's what the new rep thinks is most important. And so I think companies need to be really careful with that on on what do they lead with, what do they start with. And, and yeah, there there is value in product knowledge. Absolutely, the better you know the product, yeah, the better you can sell. But at least with a product as, as complicated and as, as complex as Qualtrics can be, it's a lot easier to zoom out and just look 10,000 foot view. What's the actual business impact? That's what I want to talk about on a cold call. Honestly, that's what I want to talk about in my discovery call and my product demonstration. You know, it's really not until the, the, the maybe second or third actual product demo where I'm in the weeds talking about all these different features, the hundred question types that we have and the, you know, the, the ability to export into SPSS and some of these other things. They don't need to know that initially, right? On occasion, I might get on the phone with with a, a PhD market researcher where that's that's their world and they want to know that right off the bat. But most of our prospects that we're calling into, it, the, the first several calls, are much like any sales cycle, are, are kind of high level. Here's the pain point we have. Here's what we results, need to do. Yeah. How can you help? What, what's the result going to be? So that that's our approach. That's not to say that's that's uh, the approach for everybody, but at Qualtrics, again, through trial and error, that's what we've learned to, uh, that works best for us. So when a new person comes into this development program, what separates the people that do really, really well from those that are just kind of average and those that do poorly? So in terms of characteristics, (laughs) behavior, education, whatever variables we can point to. Yeah, so I'm I'm a firm believer, and I think everybody at Qualtrics in in a leadership role is that we we don't care what somebody's background was. We don't care what somebody studied. 
Um, cells is not unique just to somebody who studied cells. Some of our best people are, you know, people who, who studied actuarial science, right? Or studied, uh, they were pre-med at one point and, and had some crazy physics degree or something like that. And then they, they find their true calling or passion for, for cells. Um, what we care about at Qualtrics, so I'll give you kind of the five things we look for and we screen for, not to give a, anybody a cheat sheet that wants to apply with us, but we, we screen for five categories, right? Uh, really anywhere at Qualtrics, but specifically in cells. The first is, and these aren't in any particular order, but the first one I always say is IQ. And there's probably more PC way to say it, but you got to be smart, right? Like we, we sell a technical product to technical individuals. Rarely are we selling to somebody who purchases a lot of software. And so a lot of times we're, we're holding somebody's hand saying, hey, you're going through an RFP process. Here, here's what you should be looking for, right? Uh, here, here's the questions you should be asking. Now, obviously, we, we position that in a, in a situation where, it, you know, here's what you should be looking for. Oh, by the way, we check all those boxes. But a lot of times we're selling to, to researchers who aren't used to purchasing software. And so yeah. uh, I have to have a really good understanding of, of not just our product and the impact, but how, how a company should be making a purchasing decision. So uh, IQ goes into that a lot. Uh, second one I would say is EQ. So it's your emotional intelligence, your ability to carry a conversation, read a, read a you know, situational awareness. Some people call it that. I call it the airplane test. Can I sit on, next to you on a plane for three hours and not get bored? Could we carry on an engaging conversation? Do you know how to respond in a certain social setting? Situational leadership is a term that I love. It, you got to be able to, to adapt to any situation and read it and, and know, know how and what to say and how to apply certain things. So EQ is really, really important for us. If you think of traditional sales, side note, Use car sales guys, it's kind of high EQ, low IQ, right? That's not to stereotype, but that's kind of typical. Um, I think that, that as sales has transformed, specifically in the B2B space, you, you have to have both. Regardless of product or industry, you got to have IQ and EQ. I think those, those go hand in hand. Third one would be motor. There's something to be said about somebody that can just pound the pavement, plug in, and dial dial 500 calls in a day. Um, you can't just smile and dial and expect that's going to pan out. you gotta, you got to, again, have that IQ that, that you can learn and adapt and, and develop over time. But... That's my story. I was never the, you know, smartest kid. I didn't have a whole lot of, of sales experience, but I, I'd be dang sure that nobody outcalled me. Right? I made more calls. I had I had a bigger pipeline. I set up more meetings than anybody in my region, and that's how I've I've kind of succeeded over the years. And, and then along the way, you you pick up the product and, and the nuances of, of what we do. The last two that we look at specifically at Qualtrics are really qualitative, but we look at again trajectory. What have you done in the past? Um, that has put you on a specific trajectory, right? And again, I don't care if you've sold before, but whether it be uh, your GPA or extracurriculars you're involved with or, or volunteer in the community or church, what have you done in your life that has proven your ability to separate yourself from others and, and put you on a good trajectory? Because if you've done that elsewhere in your life, again, sports, volunteer, whatever, we can translate that into sales. It's easy to believe you could do it again. Yeah, okay. absolutely. And then third is, is uh, super qualitative but culture fit. We've, uh, I, do, I do a lot of interviews, probably on average 10 a week, and I have for the past uh, four and a half years. So I've, I've gone through a lot of candidates. And uh, there, there has been times where I see somebody that's just an exceptional talent that has sold before that I know would pick up our product like that and, and run with it and do really well, but they didn't fit our culture. Yeah. And, and that for us is, is more important than anything. Find, finding a, a company culture and a product that you believe in, you can get behind is super critical. And again, I don't care how good somebody is, if they're going to be toxic and they're going to be uh, the whiner and the entitled sales rep, like there's just, there's no space for that at a company like ours. And so again, very qualitative to what we look for. Um, but that's, uh, that's kind of the, the top five that we, we go after. So I'd say, you know, the first two uh, are, you know, your ability to work smart, right? The third, your ability to work hard. Yep. We got to have both. We can't have you dumbly sprinting toward the finish yeah. line, you know, uh, or what you think is the finish line only yep. to find out it's the wrong direction. Yeah. <laughs> Um, we also can't have you be very insightful, but lazy when it comes to trajectory. So what, what types of things qualify for that? What types of things do you see in people's resumes or come up in interviews that make you think, okay, this, this is the right, yeah. this is the right um, thing. Really anything and everything. And, and it's kind of hard because again, a, a lot of our candidates that I work with are, are in school. So there's not a whole lot of any kind of trajectory to look at. So it's, it's probably the, one of the harder categories for me to screen for. But a couple examples, I, again, I just did some interviews this morning and there was an individual who was able to prove that she, she was the number one intern out of 121 reps for her internship last summer. So to me, that proves insane trajectory. I, I, don't, I didn't care what her internship was. I didn't care what she was doing. I said, what, did you have hard metrics that you were held accountable to? She said, yes. And I said, it was based on those hard metrics that you were, you were given this award as, as intern of the year and you were, you were number one out of 100 plus reps. Like to me, that's, that's great trajectory. Yeah. Um, an ability to—it's not above average. And yeah, it's not, <laughs> it's not you know the top, 
<laughs> you know, quarter. It's yeah, it's number it's, one. That's it a is. different yeah. uh, animal altogether. And that's and again back to a point I mentioned earlier. We and this isn't to toot our own horn or anything. It's just that we believe we have an exceptional product. It's a very unique company. Our growth, our profitability, our trajectory as a company is is uh, second to none out there in, in the in the SaaS privately held company space right now. And so we're we're careful who they bring in. Not not the fact that like you got to be the best of the best and or you can't work here, but we're. We're, we're very protective of our company. We're very protective of, of what we've built in our culture. I get really emotional whenever, on a rare occasion, when, when a, a job offer comes along, it's like, oh, that kind of piques my interest. Should I look at that? It's emotional to ever think about leaving Qualtrics because of what we've built and what I've seen seen it grow. So I'm very protective with who, who we bring into the company. But yeah, we hire less than 5% of all applicants. So it, it, it is not top 25%. It's not top 50. It's it's top 5% is, is who we're looking for. So, and it's hard, right? Not, I mean, even the best any reason in the world, in my opinion, are, are wrong 25% of the time. One out of four, they make a mistake. We're, mm-hmm. we're no different at Qualtrics and we're quick to realize those mistakes and, and fix them is, is uh, with obviously within the legal bounds that we have, but we're quick to fix those as, as quickly as possible. You know, other, other things for a trajectory, an ability to, to be hyper engaged in a lot of activities and, and juggle, have a lot of balls up in the air. Uh, somebody who has a three, Three seven GPA who works a full time job on the side and also volunteers twelve hours a week like that's a great trajectory. That means you're busy, you're involved, you like to stay busy. You don't you don't like to sit at home on a Saturday. Other things. One of my favorite interview questions is, uh, you have a day off this coming Saturday. Walk me through your your day. What does it look like? And if somebody says, oh, I sleep until ten and I get up and maybe shower by noon and and I play some video games and I and then I go out drink with my buddies, like it's probably not the best trajectory. Right, but it says, "Oh, day off!" Like it's rare when I get a day off. I'm gonna get up early and go for a run. I'm gonna go to the gym and work out. I'm gonna come home and I'm gonna, uh, you know, uh, get through this yard project that I have. And then I'm gonna read a book in the afternoon. And then I'm gonna go, you know, spend time with family in the evening or whatever. Right? If if they can map out how they, they spend, they have that an idea time. of what they would actually do. Yeah. It's not just passive or reactive or yeah. something like that. Yeah. So there's a lot that goes in trajectory, but a couple examples there. Okay. And then uh, in terms of culture fit, so how do you determine that? Because I'm always fascinated by, it seems like if, if I were to survey a bunch of companies, if I were to use Qualtrics and survey a bunch of Please hiring <laughs> people, HR types, and say, you know, what are some of the things you look for? They're going to come up with some really abstract, yeah. ill-defined concepts in my mind. They're going to say, yeah. well, I want people who are who have high character. So, yeah. Okay, well, how are you like, going to tell? You know? <laughs> and and, and my, my concern there is if you don't, you know, if you can't define it, if you don't really have a strong idea, then you're just going to end up using some insane heuristic, like, uh, I like the dude's sweatshirt, you know, now, now they'd never yeah. admit that out loud, but that's what it comes down to. Right. Yeah. Like, Oh, you know, I, I, I kind of like the person. So I assume they have good character. Yeah. Well, okay. Maybe, Yeah. maybe not. But so, and when I hear culture fit, that's one that's like very, okay. Abstract. I don't know yep. what that necessarily means when somebody says it. So what does it mean to yeah. you? And then how do you actually gauge that in a, in an applicant through a resume or through an interview? Yeah, yeah. To be fair, it is it is it, it's a fairly ambiguous uh, metric, right? It's not even a metric. It's a fairly ambiguous characteristic to look for. So, again, we have a unique culture at Qualtrics. I've I've uh, I've been there six years, as I mentioned, and it's so funny when I uh, when I bring you know my family in for an office visit, or I got family from out of town or friends that come in. We walk through the office, right? We have uh, our office is incredible. Provo, Utah, 151,000 square foot building we just moved into. All glass. And there's no real walls anywhere in the building, so I can look down the whole row and it's just you know glass conference rooms and open desks there's no cubicles so it's very free-flowing like a lot of companies are today but they walk through and they see that we have an open dog policy there's dogs all over the office right and we have a, a endless cereal bar and we have an ice cream machine and an nacho machine and skateboards to get around the office faster right the ice cream machine and a what machine nachos co- we, nacho, have, we have a nacho okay. we have cotton candy i mean it my kid thinks i work at disneyland <laughs> whenever he comes to work it's we have a, we have an on-site playground for kids we have a whole uh, field out out back with a waterfall and a river and it, it's just this really great green space with wi-fi towers out there so people go out and work right so so anyways my family comes through and they're like oh man like your culture so cool i wish i could work at a company with such a great culture and i just chuckle because to me those things are not culture right those are those yeah. are those are it's office candy it's perks or aesthetics yeah so. it's 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 a great recruiting tool right our office is our number one recruiting factor so, so though i i, I don't want to say i'm grateful I, i'm super grateful that, that qualtrics provides those things but to me culture is it's the underlying DNA of a company. Like, what are, what are the principles, the leadership pillars that govern a company? And does an individual fit into that mold, right? So for us, uh, out in Utah, we love tacos, right? So our, our, our cultural acronym is tacos. And so it's five, five things. So we look for uh, transparency. One is the T. 
we're a transparent company top to bottom. There is no big ivory tower with our CEO's office. He's got a desk just down the road from ID, right? Or from where I'm at. Uh, we have a company-wide meeting every Thursday morning where every department head gets up and gives a state of the business update. So I never have to wonder where are we at on that feature product roadmap? Where are we at on our quarterly target for the month from sales? Uh, what lawsuits do we have pending from legal, right? There's all these different things that, that they give updates. It's extremely transparent. That used to be open door. We, every Friday we could bring in our family and it was kind of this Q&A. We've gotten to the size, actually we did several years ago, probably four years ago where we, we kind of made that closed door, just employees only, because there's a lot of things we discussed that are, are pretty sensitive to the company. Uh, within reason, we're not talking about, you know, when we're going to IPO and things like that, but within reason, like we, every employee has a right to know what's going on uh, within our doors. We have sales numbers plastered on, on TV is all throughout the building, right? So there's nowhere to hide. You can't blend into the crowd and say, oh crap, I'm only 25% of quota, but I'm going to blend in with these other guys, right? Mm-hmm. You're either, your name is either green, yellow, or red. And that's uh, updated, you know, uh, in real time across the company. So transparency is really big for us. The A in tacos is all in. And it's one of my favorites because it's, uh, as I mentioned, I, I've promoted probably over 300 individual account executives to the, to the sales floor at our company. And there's probably another 40 or 50 that, that we've had to, to let go, right, for whatever reason. And the one common trait between those who succeed and those who don't, rather the common trait between those who, who don't succeed is a lack of vision, right? They're not bought in. They're not all in. They view it as a job, not as a career. Mm-hmm. The bar that we have at our company and the expectations that we have People burn out real quick if they're not if they don't believe in what we're doing and, and um, it's 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 it, it, you know to be really blunt it's survey technology right it's not super sexy we're not out you know selling this crazy product now now we have evolved a lot and we have a, an exceptionally uh, unique and powerful tool that we sell the companies out there but uh, for some people it's hard to really catch the vision of, of what it is that we're doing and the impact that we're having and so being all in is really important now the bar that our company is set for us is is really high but it's two way street. Right, I have really high quotas I have to go hit, but I demand a lot from Qualtrics because they demand a lot from me. So, in the form of compensation, in the form of job security, in the form of equity, in the form of incentive trips and perks and, and resources and, and, and sales assets that they provide for us, um, that, that's definitely a two-way street. So, Qualtrics has bought in on us. We have to go all in on on them. Right, the C is customer obsessed. We sell a customer satisfaction software, so we better dang well be good at customer satisfaction. Uh, we have uh, we have about an 89% renewal rate and a 100, 130% upgrade rate, uh, which are, if anybody in the SaaS space is familiar with those uh, those numbers, that's pretty dang world class, pretty great. Um, so we focus heavily on our customers. Even even though I'm not on the front lines as a sales rep, I still think of myself as customer facing, right? Every every engineer who sits up in their dark office on, or in their dark corner on the third floor, at any point in time, they have to be prepared to jump on a co- client call or fly out to a client. So we all believe we're client facing and, and are heavily focused on their success. Um, the O in tacos is one team, and I love that one. It's there is you'll never hear anybody at Qualtrics say that's not my job, right? Mm-hmm. They'll they'll uh, they'll be hearing from somebody if, if, if somebody ever says that, right? And, and, and there's all like this trip, right? I'm out here in Georgia at NCSC, a great event. I, I'm not a recruiter. I don't have to be here, right? But the recruiting team asked me to come out, and I jumped all over it because hey, I love I love my recruiting team who I work with, and I want them to hit their numbers and succeed. So I'm more than willing, more than happy to come out and do that. And the last one is Scrappy. Um, so those are our, our T-A-C-O-S tacos. Scrappy is, is not cheap. A lot of people think it's cheap. But if there's one thing to know about Qualtrics, it's that we're, we're extremely profitable. We've had 50% year-over-year growth every, every year I've been there, as I mentioned. And for a lot of companies, it's do we want profit or do we want growth? And for Qualtrics, that was never a question. Right? That's what makes us so unique financially in, in the growth that we've seen and, and what makes it such a, a hot, hot company right now. But Scrappy is how we got to where we're at. It's the underdog mentality, the chip on our shoulders, uh, we call it being fat. We never want to be a fat company. We don't want to get to the point where we there's so much political crap and red tape that we're we're super slow to pivot and we can't we can't adjust and do what we need to. So being scrappy is that mindset of of you know being the kind of the scrappy underdog, tough kid on the block mentality is is where we how we got to where we're at. And anyway, so that's that's tacos. We do eat a lot of tacos in Utah, but that's uh, kind of the, the the fun acronym that we've come up with. And actually, in, in our main office, you walk in and, and in the lobby, it's a basketball court. It's just this, this huge basketball court. Yep. And around around that court, there's five pillars, right? And, and emblazoned in, in steel on the side of those are tacos, right? The, the transparency, all in, customer success, one team, and scrappy. And so literally, those are the pillars <laughs> of our company that hold up our roof. So th- those are the things we look for. Again, that, that's extremely unique to us. We, we get that. But if, uh, if somebody doesn't check the box on all five of those things, then, then it's a no, right? We, we hire by unanimous decision. No hiring manager can make the, make the call. It's always, you go through three or four interviews and then their decision goes to a committee and that committee um, has to make a unanimous call on if we're going to make an offer or not. If there's any question on any of those characteristics, you know, the answer is a no. Wow. 
So then how do I, so I know the, the, the five characteristics of the culture. I know how to define that. How do I tell if an applicant yeah. is transparent, for example? Yeah, it's tough, right? So, so we have certain questions. We, we interview through a structured rubric at Qualtrics. So I've, uh, for example, I've been interviewing for, I've mentioned four or five years now, and I have uh, five, of those five, five categories, I've got three questions in each category. So a total of 15 questions. Every candidate has the exact same experience, the exact same questions in the same order, same time. And so making sure that we provide that continuity is really important. And obviously that last one of culture fit, I only have three questions. Right. So I don't ask five for each of those. So, so we kind of each hiring manager can, can kind of pick their questions. They pick which ones are most important for them. And, you know, they ask questions like one of my interview questions for uh, for culture fit, for example, is, you know, think post graduation when you're in the workforce and you think about your level of happiness and engagement at work. What are what are three things that you want? Three things environmentally or culture that you're that you're looking for. And if, if they say things like, well, I want a place where, where we, we are very collaborative, right? And, and, and it fosters an environment of teamwork and I can rely on my team to help have a mentor to coach me or whatever, right? That, that kind of checks a couple of boxes for us of being all in in one team. So there's certain questions that we try to get kind of strategic with. Um, I'm limited to those three questions just based on timeline. So what, what kind of question can I ask that will check as many boxes as possible for that, that culture fit? So every hiring manager goes about it slightly different, but we all look for those same characteristics. Good. You think about the people you've interviewed. Has anybody done anything that's just blown you away? Said something, demonstrated something. You know, they had a different resume, a different story, that just knocked your socks off. That just, I mean, you just in, knew in a good we've way. Got to hire this person okay. in a good way. I'll ask about a bad <laughs> way too in a second. Um, but, you know, what 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 can somebody do to to just really hit a home run in this uh, application process? Yeah, I'm trying to think recently. It's just when you do so many interviews, they start to kind of blend together. But on occasion, there's somebody like that that stands out. So, so to my my, my my structured rubric, so on each question, I have to grade somebody on one to five. So there's a five point scale, and then we tally up the average of those three questions for each category, and then tally up the five categories, and then we have a, we have a certain number benchmark that's either pass fail. And there's there's either a a strong no. The, the answers I can give are strong no, no, yes, or strong yes. So I'm trying to think of those people who who hit that bar of being a strong, strong yes. yes. It's pretty rare when that happens. I would say 98% of people who I interview are, are uh, that I pass on to the next round is a yes. It's, it's really rare to have a strong yes. I'm trying to think recently in the past, probably two or three months ago, I had one. It was a candidate from out of state. I actually don't remember the university they were at, um, but it was somebody who, again, back to those five categories, just, just did really well. They scored at least a four or higher in, in all categories, right? Um, it was somebody who had a great GPA and, and GPA... If you go on greenhouse, that's one thing Qualtrics I know gets knocked for is that we ask about that and, and put quite a bit of stock in it. But it's just, if you think of that scoring structure rubric, which all hiring managers now use, it's one out of 15 data points, right? So I know some people are like embarrassed about their GPA. If you're embarrassed about your GPA, like it's your own fault. There's probably a reason for that, right? Yeah. So um, somebody who had a really high GPA, this individual was a student athlete at a division one college, still had a super high GPA, even being a division one scholarship athlete, had a, uh, not a full-time, but a part-time job, was working 25 plus hours a week, volunteered on the week Weekend, was involved in their sorority. I think what other things uh, stuck out. She was one of those one of, one of her internships. I don't know if she was number one, but she was she was in the top five percent of, of again quantifiable metrics uh, in, in her internship. And then and then just kind of checked all those boxes culturally as as far as kind of what we're looking for. So demonstrated really good trajectory, had good IQ, really good EQ. So I don't know if I could point out something exactly other than I, I think that's really impressive. Somebody who's an athlete, obviously dedicated to their craft, uh, takes up a ton of time being a, being a D1 scholarship athlete. That's, that's more than a full-time job, let alone school on top of that with a 3.8 GPA, let alone having a, a 25 hours well, week yeah. job. Um, so people like that, they're pretty rare when they come along, but but they're out there and that's, that's who we want to go after and hire. But I would just say in a nutshell, execute really dang well in every area of your life, right? If there's one area that's it's suffering, go fix it, right? If you don't have, you don't feel like you have time to, to read books and develop yourself, like make some adjustments and prior, like reprioritize some things. So I would say making sure that, that you have, you're really well-rounded. That's kind of, kind of what we're looking for. And I think any company would say the same. We don't want um, some brainiac who's just a, just a jerk to work with, right? Nobody, nobody wants to work with somebody who's super smart and a jerk and vice versa. Nobody wants to work with a, an idiot. That's <laughs> right. So you gotta, yeah. you gotta kind of find that balance. All right. So, what about what about people that just blow the interview? What 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 does somebody say or do or demonstrate that just gets them completely immediately axed from your consideration set? So that, that's kind of the nice thing about the structured rubric is that there's nothing anybody could do immediately to like. So I 
for, for two and a half years, I did not have the structured rubric. It was just, I, I had my own thing. I walked in and I would sit down and based on somebody's appearance, I would, I would kind of say, okay, I'm not going to hire this person. Right. But I'm here for half an hour. So let's go through these questions. Right. Mm-hmm. Just to, just to be polite. The beauty of the structured interview, and I, I actually, it was our, our head of North American sales. It's like really pushed this initiative across the company. I hated it at first. I felt like it, it handcuffed me. It took away from the candidate experience because it was so structured. It was the exact same every time. And we didn't have enough time to kind of shoot the breeze and get to know each other. So candidates were on edge a little bit more. But the, the more I've practiced and done it, I've gotten, I've gotten a lot better at providing that good candidate experience while still being able to ask each question in a vacuum. And that, that's what was hardest for me was not letting one answer bleed into the score of another answer, right? So I kind of have to wipe my mind with every question, start over and, and really stick to those buckets. But I'm, I'm thinking back to some <laughs> some good stories before we got to the structured interview. I mean, just simple things. I, I had a kid show up uh, in shorts to an interview one time. Mm. Like now, now our culture at Qualtrics, we wear shorts. We wear flip-flops in the summer. We don't have a dress code. Wear clothes, cover up. That's, that's our dress code, right? But it's an interview, right? Don't, don't, yeah, don't yeah. Maybe dress. Maybe that's not the best foot yeah, uh, forward. Like yeah. Put your best foot forward. So little things like that. You know, somebody who obviously lies, it, it blows me away how many liars I get in an interview. Um, I had a kid one time who told and especially you lie about something so verifiable. He lied about that he was on the basketball team at a certain university and he was the captain of the team and, you know, had, had set all these state records and stuff. So in the interview, I was like, okay, I feel like I, I'm, a, I'm a sports guy. My, my degree is in sports, sports broadcasting. So I was like, I probably would have heard of this kid. So I Googled him and couldn't find anything. Right. Mm. Like nothing whatsoever about all these records that he had set and whatnot. Some so of those uh, secret record holders. Yeah, yeah. of course. Yeah. It's, uh, maybe his, his home court in his backyard. Those are the records. That he <laughs> uh, so things like that, just things that, that don't impact it one way or the other. And, and people feel a need to lie about it. I think I read a study one time that 90 percent of people lie on a resume or in an interview. It's human nature. We want to put our best foot forward. But like, be honest, own what you've done. If, if, if you're you've done well, great. Own it. I, I interviewed a candidate last night who was. Uh, extremely humble and at the end of the interview uh, he asked for feedback i was like you're a super impressive candidate own that like now is the time to brag a little bit and, and show us how good you are you're, you're, you're putting your best foot out there so if if you're kind of holding stuff back and you don't like talking about yourself like that's me i i, I don't like talking about myself but in an interview dang right that's I'm gonna, the, I'm gonna talk the about time and place to do it yeah, yeah. Total side note, one time I had it, we do a lot of, uh, we recruit heavily out of the state of Utah because we have pipelines built in state. And so a lot of it is kind of reactive recruiting, whereas we go proactive out of state events like this and whatnot. And I had a kid one time, I remember where they were from, um, but he, he showed up late to the interview. <clears throat> so when I, for me, that's a time dividend. If I, I, I do so many interviews and somebody didn't show up, it's, it's kind of a, a good thing, right? I, I, great. I'm going to sit in my room. My team thinks I'm in an interview. I'm going to get some work done. And so it was pulled up on the, on our big, uh, you know, whatever, 60 inch monitor in, in this, again, glass rooms so they're not, we don't have walls. And was, so we're sitting there. I logged into the, the, we use zoom, right? So it's kind of a, a Skype video uh, yep. conferencing and I didn't, I didn't log out. It was like 15 minutes into the interview and I just, I just kept my thing logged on and I was sitting there working on an email or something. And all of a sudden his camera turns on and the, no joke, this kid's sitting there buck naked <laughs> and the, and the camera set up like on his bed. And I don't know if, what, what the story was, but he realized that he was on camera and said, said some choice words and logged out really quick. And so I told our recruiters, I was like, so pretty sure we don't need to reschedule that interview. Here's what happened. And um, so, again, situational awareness. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> Understanding uh, I mean, when you're on camera. What's going on, yeah. <laughs> so if you show up naked to an interview, that's probably a... Yeah. Just know uh, it's important. You should probably research whether or not the company you're interviewing with has glass walls also. Yeah. You know? yeah. It, uh, are you risking just one person seeing you, yeah. uh, you know, uh, sprawled out on your bed or yeah. maybe like a 1700? Yeah, it was, uh, yeah. It was we, we all got a good laugh at it. Um, well, I'm trying to keep track of the time here as well. Maybe I will jump to it. There's a question I like to close with just in case somebody's listening and says, well, you know, I, I like I like some of the things Tommy said. I like the way he's thinking. I wonder what types of materials went in to influence his thinking. And sure. uh, so, you know, if you were to think of a few books, maybe one or Ooh. one to three books that uh, every sales leader should have on their desk or their bookshelf, uh, what would those be and why? Yeah, two or three is tough. We we uh, uh, or we, eight or nine. Yeah, right. Or if, uh, is that easy? Um, yeah, so we, we believe in, in heavily self-development at Qualtrics. All of our reps, they get one hour per day of self-development time. So they can spend time shadowing more calls. They can be in the product. They can read books, right? So we actually have a library at Qualtrics that you can 
Qualtrics purchases a lot of books like you know the, the, what we encourage from a sales leader's perspective to, to go read. So um, give you two or three. So I'm a, I really enjoy um, the book To Sell as Human. Mm-hmm. It's not necessarily a sales methodology book. It, it's um, it's about how it's human nature to sell, whether you're in, you're in a career of sales or not. I, I found that as I recruit students who maybe aren't studying sales or kind of interested but not really sure, it's a really good book to to understand what goes into sales in today's landscape. Um, it's a, it, we we all sell something regardless of if you're in marketing or engineering or sales or or client success or whatever. You're, you're always selling something. Right? That, that transaction. Is, is human nature since the beginning of time. So it has, has been a part of, of our nature. So that's a really interesting read. Again, not necessarily methodology, just more so high level, what is sales and um, how it, it is a part of our daily life, whether or not that's your career. Um, the Challenger Sell, that, that's uh, specifically sales methodology. That's how we sell at Qualtrics. We, we like to be, again, we, we're very consultative in our approach. To be consultative at times, you have to, you have to challenge the status quo. You have to understand what a client is currently doing and and respectfully, but but uh, sometimes forcefully challenge them. When they have, why, you know, help me understand why you guys are doing it that way. You guys are still using paper and paper and pen surveys. Like it was that was is it because it's been cost prohibitive to look at anything else? Is that just because your your executive staffs like super old school? Is there a reason you're doing that, or is it just that's the way we've always done it? So challenging the status quo and, and helping companies understand there is a better way um, to go about it. And there, there's a lot more to it, but yeah, the Challenger Sell is a really good book, um, specifically on on sales methodology, and then. One other book that I've read is is let's let's get real or let's not play. And I apologize, I don't I don't know the authors of these books off the top of my head. But okay. I, I think uh, to sell as human is Dan 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 Pink. Yep. Yeah. Challenger sell Dixon and somebody else. I think I, I forget. And then uh, let's get real and let's not play is is uh, is a really good book as well. So some of, uh, Challenger sell specifically sells related to sell as human and let's get real let's not play a little bit less sales methodology. Um, but but for me, we're, we're impactful in my career. Just of and what, what what's covered in the uh, let's get real, let's not play. So it just talks a lot about um, a little bit of, of methodology and approach of of you know when you're in a business transaction, talk about real world stuff, right? Like let's not, like quit quit blowing smoke and quit talking about oh, we're you know yeah potentially you could have a 500 percent ROI on this product. Like like you share real stories, be real with people. It's get, it's human get concrete, to, yeah, get specific. human to human interaction. I think some of the the worst mistakes I see junior reps make is that they want to talk up to somebody or worse, they want to talk down to somebody, right? One of the worst things to do is whether it's a cold call or in a product demo or contract negotiation, don't talk up or down to somebody, create a, a peer-to-peer bridge dialogue-based conversation. The sooner you do that, the sooner you gain trust. In this book, Let's Get Real, Let's Not, not, not Play talks about how do you do that? How do you build that that connection and, and get, get um, trust built really quick in a conversation so that when it comes time to ask for the close or it comes time to challenge them on a certain status quo that they're doing, um, they, they're more receptive. They're a little bit more open to the conversation. That's it for this interview. I hope you got something valuable out of it. Of course, if you did, be sure to subscribe and rate this podcast on whatever app you use to listen. Also, share this with your colleagues and friends, and let's continue to have a deeper discussion on all things related to selling and sales leadership. See you next time in the Sales Lab.